The Heritage Baptist Church, it's about that time. Let's stand and turn to number 68, a very worshipful song taken from Isaiah chapter 6. Holy, holy, holy is Amen. the Lord.
ask her and um, have something for us today. We pray for those who aren't here, whether they're traveling or in training or whatnot, that your um, protection can be over them. And um, we just thank you once again for this time. We're going to pray all these things in the first name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. We do have some announcements to go through today. And uh, maybe a few more than you were used to. Do, can we put it on the ones where it should be? How about that? All right. Can you put it on the one that's not flipping automatically, please? Here in church. All right, so <clears throat> we got all kind of technical difficulties here this morning. So uh, let's try that. All right, so <clears throat> Bolt is on Wednesday nights. That's Bible centered, outreach focused, life skills learned, transformation experienced. Uh, Denise teaches obviously uh, Bible lessons as well as uh, life skills in that. Hey, there it is. Can you flip? All right. Tuesday training. We will start this week. Uh, we will try to finish before Christmas. We will try to... All right. Hold on a second. This is going to make a little racket. Uh, we will try to finish um, Old Testament before the end of the semester. And we will try to finish Homiletics 1. And we've already finished Doctrines 1. We may actually finish Doctrines uh, 2 before the semester is out. We're kind of in a rush because uh, our students are all PCS and amen. But uh, anyway, it is a part of Heritage Baptist Institute in Cleveland, Ohio. You can actually get college credit. You do have to pay for that. If you do, the classes for me are free, but you can go to the next one, please. So celebrating God's goodness, ages 4 to 10 in the fellowship hall. When we shake hands today, I will dismiss ages 4 to 10 uh, to go take part in that. Uh, Miss Denise will be teaching that. We do have a special building offering today. Uh, what we're going to do is we'll take the regular offering at the regular time, and we will take the building offering at the close of service. I'll have two young men stand at the back, the back of the auditorium. Should you put it, maybe you have one check written uh, with your tithes and you have something special if you will uh, for the building offering as well and you put that in the regular offering, offering please notate on the envelope so Miss Bree knows that. So next month we have our business meeting on world missions. Basically the subject of that meeting is eternity and it is the, the fate of the world depends upon what we do, okay? So uh, we will have services nightly at 7 o'clock from Wednesday to Saturday. And then Sunday morning we will do 10 and 11 and we will dismiss the 5 p.m. service. We won't have it. I have begun to fast and pray about um, my part in missions for the coming year. But my part in God's plan every day. That's why I put fast and pray about your part or our part in the Father's plan. And some people today, I'm going to take just a moment on this particular announcement. Some people have said in the 28 years I've been in the ministry that uh, it's the church age and we don't fast. But I want you to know in Luke 5 when Jesus was asked how come his disciples did not fast. And they quoted that the Pharisees fasted and and the Sadducees fasted, and the disciples of John fasted, Jesus said, when the bridegroom, that's himself, is taken away, then uh, shall they fast in those days. So there's nothing wrong with fasting. Now, there, there is uh, uh, a couple of three different kinds of fast, a couple or three is what I said. A lot of people think I say a couple three, a couple or three different types of fasting in Scripture. I won't do this every week, but I'm going to take a moment to run through those types. There's, there's what I call, Fred, the supernatural fast, all right? <clears throat> Moses fasted for 40 days, the Bible says, and he neither ate bread nor drank water. Most people would die after 10 days without water. He could not have done that without the supernatural empowerment of God, all right? 
And then the Bible says he came down. Remember, they were in sin. He corrected the sin. He went back up on the mountain. Maybe he ate when he came down and helped, helped uh, or handled the difficulty that uh, they were facing with the golden calf and all of that. But it doesn't record that he ate or didn't eat. I, so I can't argue that point. But what I do know is he went right back up on the mountain. Whether he ate when he was off the mountain or not, so see, he went right back up on the mountain for another 40 days, which the Bible states again, he neither ate bread nor drank water. I say again, that's supernatural. Most of us would die if we tried that. Then Jesus fasted 40 days. The Bible does not use that terminology that he did not drink water. It said he did not eat. So he fasted a complete, we call it a complete fast, for 40 days. That's number two. Number three, there is uh, a complete fast, but only one or two days per week. The Pharisees did that. Remember, I fast twice in the week, he said very arrogantly. All right, so there's nothing wrong with that. In fact, lost people, lost health experts say that it actually helps your body if you will do a complete fast. Uh, so at some point, you know, whether it's one day a week or one day a month, they say it actually helps your body. Uh, I want to hit that a second, and I'm going to go to the, well, I'll tell you what, I'll come back to that. The fourth kind of fast listed in Scripture is, it doesn't really have a name, but most people refer to it as the Daniel fast, because Daniel is the one who did it. I can give you the verse for it. I think it's in Daniel chapter 6, but... I can find it really quickly. It's marked in my Bible. He said that he did not drink wine, nor flesh, nor pleasant bread for 21 days. So he didn't eat. Of course, hopefully we don't drink alcohol at all. But no alcohol, no bread, or at least no pleasant bread. Now, you, some people eat day-old bread, moldy bread. I'm not about it. If I'm going to do a Daniel fast, I just don't eat bread. Amen. Um, maybe you can eat a cracker and say you're still on a Daniel fast, okay? But <clears throat> uh, no meat, no bread, uh, no, no wine for the 21 days. Now, there's something today that's actually quite vogue, and that's why I have this here where you've got a period of time that you eat in a period of time that you don't in a day. What is that called? It's a day. What? Intermittent fasting, okay? And <clears throat> I knew about intermittent fasting long before I ever heard the term intermittent fasting. A, a preacher that I held in high regard as a young man, in fact, I still do, even though he's gone on to be with the Lord, he's the only person I know uh, who fasted 80 days. Now, he did drink water, coffee, tea, these kinds of things, but nothing caloric, no, no calories for, for 80 days. He did 40, and he felt like the Lord said, do 40 more, so he did 40 more, all right? He was praying for revival within his church and within the country, and he encouraged his people to take part, but he didn't encourage them to fast 40 days. He encouraged them to fast one meal or maybe two meals one day or maybe two days a week. So when I say I'm asking you to fast, number one, if you have a health problem, like I know there's at least one person in the room, and I believe two, uh, with diabetes, well, you need to talk to a health professional because I can't tell you whether that's healthy or not for you, okay? I don't want you to hurt yourselves. But I'm asking you to skip a meal. Maybe skip two. On one day, at the most two, Tuesdays and Thursdays, maybe. You can pick the day and pray about your part in God's plan. Look around. Seriously, I want to everybody, just take a, take a look around at the auditorium. And not too long ago, we had 88 people in here. That road right there in front of Hillary, they about to go. It's two singles that are on uh, the adventure thing right now that are going to soon transfer. That's a fellow in a pink shirt back here that's taking a job in another country. And he's going to, of course, there's a bunch of pink shirts in here today. So y'all guess which one of them it is, amen. But he took a job in another country. 
and he's going to be leaving soon. But this didn't come as any surprise to God. You understand? Jacob, he's homesick. The Beasleys are homesick. Now, the Beasleys have a little while yet, I think, but Jacob and them, they're leaving in the spring. Not because they're mad at us, but because the Air Force is saying, hey, you got to go save us. But God knows. And he left you and me here to build this church again. And I'm asking you, it's important. It is eternally important. And I'm asking you as your pastor, just get one or two meals on one or two days and pray about your heart and his plan. Because you and I may be discouraged when we see the, the numbers shrinking. But he knows. And besides that, think of the churches where these people are going. They're going to be glad to get some good workers. Amen. Let's pray about our part in his plan. Next slide, please. We'll try to hurry through the others. We are going to have men's breakfast on the 28th. And on the 28th, we will talk about what we're going to do the rest of the year. Because October 26th, there's a fall festival. Uh, November, the last Saturday, is the week of Thanksgiving. The last Saturday is right before New Year's. This may be our last one for the year, but we'll, I'm not going to make that decision. I'll let you make that decision, but we'll talk about that. Uh, if we do have one on the last Saturday in October, we probably need to go to a restaurant so that the ladies can don't have to clean up after us and decorate, right? Okay, next one, please. There's a few more. Fall Festival, I mentioned that. Go ahead. The Tuesday night before Thanksgiving. I call it recount and remember. We will praise God for what he has done at some point in our life. Hopefully you got something special from this year. But maybe you got something special that you've never gotten over throughout the time that you've been saved. We'll give testimonies of praise and we will close the service by celebrating communion. Thanksgiving Day, we will have a meal here at the church. Uh, we'll give details as we go further along, but the, I, I believe the church is going to provide the meat and you'll just provide the fixings and we'll just have a family day. We are our family in Europe, right? They said we're going to try to get together as a family on Thanksgiving Day. Come on. Saturday night, the 7th of December. Uh, details forthcoming, but there is the multi-church Christmas banquet uh, for uh, 12 and up. Uh, it's going to be from... 5 to 8, 17 to 20. Come on. On, uh, there's, uh, on the calendar shows a Christmas party just for the church youth on the 13th. And on the 14th is the church-wide Christmas party uh, banquet-type event at Bellini's. There should be one more slide. All right. And that's the Bellini. I need to know by the 8th of September so they can, I can tell them by the 8th of September, by the 8th of December so I can remind them exactly how many people are coming. Okay, I believe that's it. You want to flip one more and see if it goes back to bolt? All right, turn that thing off because it distracts me. Amen. When we shake hands, I'm going to let 4 to 12 go with Miss Denise, but let's all stand. Turn to number 38, How Great Thou Art. We'll sing one verse and then we will shake hands.
sweet hour of prayer, sweet hour of prayer. <clears throat> so we have been going through 2 Corinthians, I'm sure everybody in the room knows that, and we're going to be in chapter 7 today. I'm going to read chapter 7, and then I'm going to try to give you a two-hour sermon in 32 minutes, amen. Let's see about it. Even though we preached through chapter 7, verse 1 last week, I want to begin with, uh, it bugs me not to read the whole chapter. Okay, so 2 Corinthians 7, 1. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Receive us. We've wronged no man. We've corrupted no man. We've defrauded no man. I speak not this to condemn you, for I've said before that ye are in our hearts to die and live with you. Great is my boldness of speech towards you. Great is my glorying in you. I am filled with comfort. I'm exceeding joyful in all our tribulations. When we were come into Macedonia, our flesh had no rest, but we were troubled on every side. Without were fightings, and within were fears. Nevertheless, God, that comforted those that are cast down, comforted us by the coming of Titus, and not by his coming only, but by the consolation wherewith he was comforted in you when he told us your earnest desire, your mourning, your fervent mind toward me, so that I rejoice the more. For though I made you sorry with a letter, I, I do not repent, though, though I did repent. So I'm going to take just a second there. Basically, he wrote them a letter, and you've done this. You have, you have talked to a friend, whether in person or by an email or by a text, You've hit send on a text or an email, and you've wanted to take that back. Oh, they're not going to receive this well. Maybe, maybe that was me. Maybe, maybe that wasn't the Lord that wanted me to say that. And you want to unsend that text. In fact, they've actually, in some formats, Messenger and other things, you can unsend for yourself or unsend for everyone if they haven't read it yet, right? And when Paul says, I don't repent, but I did repent, that's what he's saying. He's saying, well, after I sent that letter, I'm thinking, this is going to make matters worse. I should have just hushed, right? But let's keep reading. <clears throat> For though I made you sorry with the letter, I do not repent, though I did repent. For I perceive that the same epistle has made you sorry, though it were but for a season. Now I rejoice that you were made sorry, but that you sorrowed to repentance. For ye were made sorry after a godly manner that you might receive damage by us in nothing. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation not to be repented of. But the sorrow of the world worketh death. You know what he's talking about? People all the time, very often, they get together and they sorrow about things. They commiserate is a new word we've made up in the last 10 years, I reckon, where we get together and we feel sorry for ourselves, but there's no change. We just continue to feel sorry for ourselves. We don't fix it. That is a worldly sorrow. A godly sorrow repents and allows God, whatever it is, that allows God to change it in our lives. That is a godly sorrow. A worldly sorrow is where people sit around and, and, and you know, pour out a drink to their dead friend or, or, or you know, they just, just sit around, whether it's with alcohol or without alcohol, they just sit around and whine about all the difficulties in their life. Think about this. How many people do you know who claim to be Christian even, Danny, who's been saved for 20 or 30 years and they still sorrow about things that happened when they were 10? That's not godly sorrow. That, that is your flesh, yourself, if you will, or Satan bringing you down and keeping you from active service. Godly sorrow gives it to God and walks away from it. All right, let's pick up there. 
verse 11. For behold, this self-same thing that you sorrowed after, a godly sorrow, so what carefulness it wrought in you. Yea, what clearing of yourself. Yea, what indignation. Yea, what fear. Yea, what vehement desire. What, what zeal, he goes on to say. What revenge. What's the revenge? In all things you have approved yourself to be clear in this matter. The revenge was not correcting the individual that hurt them, but them getting themselves right with God. I think particularly here, he's talking about multiple things, but one thing I think he's talking about here is where in 1 Corinthians, he tells them they need to discipline this brother who's a member of the church and is in open sin. Everybody in the church knew he was having an intimate relationship with his stepmother. And that they handled that and they cleared themselves of the matter. But it's not only that, Alex. He's, clear, he's covering some other things, which I'm going to make clear in a second. He, remember back in verses 2 to 4, he said, I've defrauded no one. Somebody, Brother Derek, has come in and run Brother Paul down. And he's also addressing that. Verse 12, wherefore, though I wrote unto you, I did not. I did it not for his cause that had done the wrong nor for his cause that suffered the wrong, but that our care for you in the sight of God might, might appear unto you. He's again begging them to notice that he cares for them. Therefore, we were comforted in your comfort. Yea, exceedingly the more joyed we for the joy of Titus because his spirit was refreshed by you all. For if I boasted anything to him of you, I'm not ashamed. But as we spake all things to you in truth, even so our boasting which I made before Titus is found of the truth. And his inward affection is more abundant towards you whilst he remembereth the obedience of you all. How with fear and trembling you received him. I rejoice therefore that I have confidence in you in all things. Chronologically this morning, we see that Paul wrote a letter. He sent Titus to correct the church. Titus was encouraged by the church because of their obedience. You, you, you can't understand until you teach a lesson or preach a sermon the joy of seeing somebody take that to themselves and begin to live what you rightly taught them from Scripture. And Titus was encouraged by the church at Corinth because they not only received him, but they received the message he had from God. And then Titus went back and encouraged Paul with, with the testimony, if you will, that the church received the correction rightly. And then Paul wrote, a second time to encourage the church. But in our text, it starts with Paul encouraging the church, Titus encouraging Paul, and, uh, excuse me, the, uh, the church encouraging Titus, and then Titus encouraging Paul. There's two things, again, that are covered here in this text. Number one is the problem from 1 Corinthians. Number two is this problem of somebody running Paul down. There, there are three things that I, I'm trying to look at my notes so that I don't ramble because I'm also looking at that clock because I spent so much time with the announcements, I'm a little behind this morning. But three things I want to mention to you in introduction. First is, is bitterness. L look with me towards the end of the New Testament in James chapter 3 real quick. James chapter 3, uh, verses 11 and following. James chapter 3. Verses 11, it's right after Hebrews, right before 1 Peter. We're going to read from 11 to 15, so five verses. Doth a fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter? Can the fig tree, fig tree my brethren, bear olive berries? Either a vine, figs, vines bear grapes. So can a fountain both yield salt water and fresh? Who is a wise man? Who is a Christ-like man? And endued with knowledge among you, let him show you out of a good conversation his lifestyle, his works, 
with meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. This wisdom descended not from above, but is earthly, sensual, and devilish. We're going to read one more. For where envying and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. When we hold bitterness against somebody, even if that person really injured us, I can think of, of I hesitate to give examples from my own life because you may someday meet these people. And I hesitate to give examples from ministry because they're pretty common things that people go through, Alex, and so then somebody might say, oh, he's talking about me. I'm not talking about anybody in the room. But I've met people who are in their 70s, Jana, and they're still bitter about something that happened when they're 13. I've met people who just, they, they, they've been hurt by a pastor, and so they never get past the bitterness that they have towards the pastor. Now, sometimes, Leon, they, they should have been convicted, and they should have repented rather than, oh, he hurt my feelings. What he told them was the truth, and they didn't receive the truth. But at the same time, pastors are also human. Parents are human. Parents make mistakes. I bet... I wouldn't ask Derek in front of his children, but I bet if Derek were to look at his own life, just like when I look at mine, just like when Fred looks at his, we look back at when we raised our children, or some of y'all, like Derek, still in the midst of raising children, we look back at things and we go, man, I wish I'd done something a little different there. I, I know I do that. Other people do that. And yet, Fred, some children... They begin to listen to other people outside mom and dad. Mom and dad have sacrificed, most parents have sacrificed most of everything. Their desires, their, their money, their work hours, their off hours for their children. And yet other people can come in and sow seeds of discord. And all of a sudden there's rebellion of those children for whom the parents have, have done everything. And there's rebellion against the person who loves them the most. Hmm. I don't know about Phil. All of Phil's kids are grown. Mine are almost grown. But I've actually gone back and apologized to my children where I thought I made a mistake. You know what? I think I failed you here. Would you forgive me? I look back and I think I should have done things differently. Why are you bringing that up? Because people can hold those mistakes that you made against you, and the bitterness won't hurt you. It's going to hurt the person that's holding the bitterness. Bitterness is a poison that we hold, sissy, towards someone else. But the poison doesn't hurt the person that we hold the bitterness for. The poison hurts us. The bitterness hurts us. And the church at Corinth, for whatever reason, had some bitterness against the Apostle Paul. And part of this chapter is him trying to cover that. Okay? The second thing I want to talk about, and I'm going to talk about it in twofold, is imputation. I M P U T A T I O N. Imputation. God imputes righteousness. See, when you Amen. called on Christ to save you, you are a sinner just like I am. But when you called on Christ to save you, he imputed his righteousness to your life. Amen. So when you stand before God at the judgment seat of Christ, you will give an account for the things that you've done in the flesh. But you're right to be there when God looks at you as to whether you should be at this judgment of believers only. He says, oh, yeah. Born of a virgin, 33 perfect years, no sin, died on a cross, got up three days later. You have the righteousness of Christ imputed to you. That's the way it's always been. The Bible says of Abraham, he believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. In the New Testament, it says imputed unto him for righteousness. God gives us this imputation of righteousness when we're saved and nobody to see not one person on this planet not satan not yourself 
And the Savior would never dream of taking it back. Amen. Nobody can take that imputation from you. Amen. But there are two other forms of imputation that are a little more difficult to deal with. When we say, go back to, the, to all of those examples that I gave you before. When we're hurt. Maybe it's a parent. Maybe it's a pastor. I've been in church for most of 56 years. There were a few years of rebellion there in my teens and 20s. I still went to church sometimes during those rebellious years. But, BJ, I've been in church since I was about five days old. I used to tell people playfully I was raised on drugs. I was drugged to church Sunday morning, drugged to church Wednesday night, drugged to church. That's a very southern statement. But, anyway, as far as I can tell, of all the pastors I had in those 50 years, I had three, Derek, that never let me down. I can honestly tell you, with my hand on the Bible, Ralph Tunnell never disappointed me. Stuart Hallman never disappointed me. Not this Stuart Hallman, but my father, Stuart Hallman. And Lloyd Sweat has never let me down. At one point or another, almost every pastor I've ever known, let alone the ones that have actually sat under their ministry, have let me down. Fellow missionaries have hurt me deeply, said untrue things about me. And if we're not careful when we've been, I don't know what you've been in, but you've been hurt someplace. You've been hurt by a pastor at some point. You've been hurt by a Christian at some point. We can apply it to other things, but it's Sunday and we're talking about being Christian. Okay, we could apply it to police and politicians, all kind of stuff. But right now we're talking about God's people. If we're not careful when we've been hurt by a pastor or a missionary, then we begin to impute the unrighteousness of the one who hurt us to other people. And they can't do anything right. Because all we see is, well... So-and-so did this, and I think that's what they're doing right now. All we see is, well, this pastor said that, and I think that's really what he meant when he said the other. Now, that's hard, because that's hard for a pastor to overcome in your life. But there's one more form of imputation. There's only one person who can take that, that second imputation away from you. I guess we could say there's three, but it all goes back to the one, the Lord. If you've been hurt by a pastor, and whether we're talking about me or your next pastor, if you impute to him the hurt that you received from some other pastor, there's only one person who can take that away from you, and that is the Lord. At the same time, he can't take it away from you if you don't surrender it to him. So that's why I say two. Now I'm going to go ahead and say three because in a minute I'm going to give you the title to the sermon. Your friend, your husband, your wife, your brother, your sister in Christ can encourage you to give that to the Lord. The third form of imputation and the same three people can take it away. I mentioned it when I was talking about the hurts that we've experienced. And that's when some third party comes in. I've seen it during my time here. Somebody has been here, loved us, loved the Lord, loved the church. And some third party comes in and begins to sow discord. People leave. That's what happened to the Apostle Paul here. Somebody has come into the church and said, you know, he's taken up that offering for missions, but he's just going to use that for himself. 
And they begin to insult his character. I think that's the hardest, the hardest hurt to overcome. It's when somebody else is whispering in your ear and telling you something. It doesn't just happen to pastors, Derek. Do you know what happens to husbands? Ladies go to work and, and, and other ladies who go, well, I tell you what you ought to do. It doesn't just happen uh, by other ladies. Sometimes men, uh, men will say to the lady. In other words, it's not just ladies telling our wives what should happen. Sometimes a man is... Is telling the wife, well, I wouldn't treat you that way. She begins to listen. She begins to, to hear that. The greatest detriment to a family, like the Smith family, the Hall family, the Trudell family, is a sower of discord who is not even a member of the family. And scripturally, Heritage Baptist Church is a family. The church at Corinth was a family. So the title of today's sermon is the importance of encouragement to the persuasion of peace. Now, the word persuasion can mean different things. We can use the word persuasion when we're trying to convince someone else to do something. But then we also use the word persuasion like attitude. Are you of this persuasion or that persuasion? Do you believe this or that? To have peace. Even the peace of God, Hillary. It is a decision. To, to rest in the peace of God. And you and I cannot take away the importance of encouraging one another to the persuasion or the mindset of peace. You look at Philippians chapter 4, and it, it, it says to rejoice in the Lord always. That's a decision. It says... Hallman's paraphrase, worry about nothing, pray about everything. Verse 6, that is a decision to be of that mindset, that attitude. It says, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. That is a decision to be of the persuasion of, of peace, and you and I cannot overestimate the value of the encouragement of our brothers and sisters to the persuasion of peace. You don't know what that person's going through. You think of it the last time. Don't don't give me an example. I heard one yesterday. <laughs> You know, I was at an intersection, and I had the right of way, and this fella almost hit me, and he finally stopped so I could use my right of way. And I really wanted to get angry and give him a piece of my mind, the brother said. But the Lord reminded me when I was at an intersection, and I didn't give up the right of way, and I nearly caused an accident. When we choose not to have peace, we're choosing to put everybody else's life under a microscope and we're refusing to put our life under the microscopic mirror of God's word. Peace. The importance of the persuasion of peace. Listen to this. You say, all oh, that's your opinion not my opinion. Proverbs 16, 28, a froward man soweth strife. What does not forward, a lot of times when we read it, all of us tend to a little dyslexia, right? We tend to a little dyslexia and we switch those words because froward is not a familiar word to us and forward is. What is froward? I've never heard it put that way. I can't say it's not right. Obstinate and disobedient. 
an obstinately disobedient many. So is strife. And a whisperer separated chief friends. Well, I just can't forgive him because Ephesians 4.32 Be ye kind, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. We're, we're commanded to encourage one another. I, I'll tell you again, you cannot put a value on encouragement. You cannot overestimate the value of encouragement. And all this is introduction, and I do have a sermon to get to. Hopefully the sermon will be shorter than the introduction, all right? In Deuteronomy 1 and 3, God commanded Moses to encourage Joshua as he took the work. But it doesn't stop there. In Judges 20 and 22, the people encouraged themselves to fight the Lord's battle. In 1 Samuel chapter 30, David, in a very stressful situation, David had been anointed to be king. He knew he was the next king, and yet the people uh, who followed after Saul wanted to stone him. What did David do? Did he sit down and have a pity party? No, the Bible says he encouraged himself in the Lord. You say, well, in those three verses were about encouraging themselves. Okay, encouraging myself. It's my job to encourage myself. And look in the mirror, that's true for you. But it is also, two of those says, we encouraged one another. They encouraged themselves. Come on, man. The Lord's got this. Come on, let's go. We can take them because the Lord's on our side. They encouraged one another. Second Chronicles 31, Hezekiah, the king, encouraged the people and the priest to obedience. Second Chronicles 35, Josiah encouraged the people and the priest in their labors and in their obedience. In Isaiah 41, the Bible says, They helped everyone his neighbor, and everyone said to his brother, Be of good courage. It's our job to encourage one another. In fact, you know, 16 times in Scripture, Danny, we are commanded to be strong and of a good courage. John 13, 34, and 35 teach us that the, the sign of true faith and allegiance to Christ is that we love one another. And yet, the church at Corinth, a church started by Paul, had been disconnected from Paul by false accusations and false teachers. Paul asked them in the last chapter to enlarge their hearts towards him. In, in chapter 7 and verse 2, let, let, let's, let's go back over there. I, it's preaching time now. I'm in high gear. Receive us. We've wronged no man. We've corrupted no man. We have defrauded no man. Okay? The Bible says, can two walk together except they be agreed? Anybody know where that's found? Raise your hand if you know where that's found. Can two walk together except they be agreed? Amos 3.3. 3. But we've changed that to the point, Fred, that if we don't, you can't walk with, with Phil because, you know, Phil's got on a gray shirt and you got on a pink one. We've changed it to the fact, oh, well, I can't be friends with them because, well, they're War Eagle and I'm, I'm, I'm Roll Tide or I'm Ole Miss and they're Mississippi State or he's from Cornwall and I'm from Smithfield. We've changed it to the point where we can't walk with nobody. That's not God's plan. Think of the original disciples. There were doctors. There were fishermen. There were tax collectors. We don't have to look alike to be alike. We don't have to have the same, I mean, in a sense, you have to have the same godly desires. But there are things that I enjoy doing that, that maybe Jeremy wouldn't want to do. And yet we're still commanded to have a heart for one another. To love one another. The emphasis is basically, Paul is telling them, you know, Macedonia is part of Asia. I had a rough time in Asia. 
but I was encouraged by Titus's report of you. If the church would allow, would follow the recipe for, you, you, you can't hold a grudge. You, you realize this? You, you can say amen now if you want to. You can't hold bitterness and be humble. Because you're arrogantly saying, I'm better than they are. Say, oh, you, you're talking to us. I cannot hold bitterness and be humble. Alex, I can't tell you how many times I've told the story, but I'm going to tell it right now to let you know that I understand if you hold bitterness, you can't be right with God. You can't be humble. You can't be who God wants you to be when you're bitter. A man did me much evil. He told some untruths about me, and it spread throughout a whole fellowship of pastors, only one of whom called to check on me to see if it were true. And I went to an altar friend and I said, Lord, I forgive this man. But the next time I drove down the highway and his family owns a large trucking company. He's not from Mississippi. He's from northern Indiana. But his distant family owns a trucking company in the state of Mississippi. And I saw one of those trucks with his name in six foot letters down the side of it. Maybe eight foot letters. The family name takes up a 45-foot trailer, 48-foot trailer. And you can ask my wife sometimes. I'd be mad all the way to Tupelo every time I saw his name. Why? Because in my head I had forgiven him, but in my heart I was still holding that bitterness for the false accusations and for the fact that he never once talked to me, Fred, he never once asked me if I had done what he said. He heard one thing and he assumed the rest and took it upon himself to tell all these other preachers. It took me some time till I saw those trucks. And I went, Lord, he did me wrong, but bless him in his work. He's trying to win people you bless him in his work. Still, I, I, there's two people in the world that I despise. That's a liar and a thief. And somebody stole two gates from me in Mississippi. And they put them up. Let's just pretend the gates were, were right there where the gold is. They put them up right there where that building supply is. I mean, they want a quarter mile away. Every time I go past them gates, I got I didn't realize, Bree, that I was actually bitter about it. I thought I was, I, I really thought it was righteous indignation. They stole. They need to be punished. Until one of my brothers at church said, Brother John, I'll tell you what. I'll go right now to Tractor Supply. They're open on Sunday afternoon. And I'll buy you two gates if you will shut up about them gates they stole. You. And I had to realize, Danny, that. So I'm not speaking down to you when I say you can't be right with God and hold bitterness. I'm speaking from a place of, hey, God pulled me out of that mire. And I'm telling you, it's unfruitful and it won't help. If we will hoist that sail of humility, hoist that sail of prayer, hoist that seeking the Savior prayer and that repentance prayer and that, that second jet-powered jib of humility, then the good old gospel ship will sail us two places. They will sail us closer to God and closer to one another. Y'all see that? It's a triangle. You got two bases at the bottom and a point at the top. Mm -hmm. The point is God. Mm -hmm. The bases are me and you. The 
closer we get to God, the closer we get to one another. That's true in our marriage. That's true in our church. It may be considered a trite, which means it's lacking originality and it's dull from overuse. It may be considered a trite statement of, of patriotism. But I'm telling you, it's true of Jana and Steve. It's true of Hillary and Abe. It's true of Phil and Ceci. It's true of Dave and Lynn. It's true of Derek and Bree. It's true of Alex and Doug and Danny and his wife and me and my wife. But it's equally true for the church. United we stay. Divided we fall. This situation we're in, the situation that church at Corinth was in, there's no surprise to, to God. So again, all that's introduction. Here's the sermon. Verses 2 to 4. Paul says, receive us, we wronged no man, we corrupted no man, we defrauded no man. I speak not this to condemn you, for I've said before, you're in our hearts. Uh, we're bragging about you, basically. I'm joyful in my tribulation because, why? Because of you. Paul encouraged the church. They, they, they knew him better than to listen to those false accusers. Paul is basically trying to convince them, hey, I would die for you. He, had, he was telling them, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm not criticizing you. I brag about you to other people. But in spite of these problems, Paul had good reason to be encouraged, even though this, this, this sower of, of difficulty, this sower of, of discord had come in the church, Paul had good reason to be encouraged because Titus had been successful to, to mend the fences, to restore the fellowship. And then Titus encouraged Paul. He, he told him. He, Paul wrote this stern letter. All right? And then he was, he was sad he had written the letter. Now, some people say, this is kind of a... Let's rush over this, but it's a true statement. Some people say, once you're saved, you never need to repent again. But that's not what Jesus said. Jesus said to Peter, his own child, repent. Hmm? Other places in Scripture lead us to believe that. And that's what Paul is saying. Paul was encouraged because they repented. Titus, the story of them repented. So Paul is encouraging the church to receive him. Titus encouraged Paul because he re recounted their obedience and the <clears throat> uh, church encouraged Titus because they received the message. You know what? I, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm really done. That's, that's the point of it. And so rather than try to find my place to get through all of the notes to that, we can't, I'm going to just go back to the beginning. We cannot overemphasize the importance of encouragement to the persuasion or the attitude of peace. We're commanded to encourage one another. We're commanded to encourage ourselves. If the church can go forward, you say, is there a problem in the church? If there is, I don't know it. But I know what God said free. The church can go forward when the church is united. And we will never be united. And maybe it's somebody, you, you know, you go back to my first point. I'm trying to come, I promise, I'm trying to come in for land. But you go back to my first example of the imputation of peace when we're hurt. If we begin to impute those hurts to other people, go, oh, well, they're going to do the same thing so and so did. They're going to do the same thing that so-and-so did. There's only one person who, know, who knows for sure you're doing that, and that's you. 
second person who might know is somebody you told it to. But the solution is the same. If somebody is sowing discord in, in the church or in your family, the solution is the same. Be ye kind, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. I know a guy who was, who was hurt badly by a particular pastor. Leon, I could tell you that pastor's name. In fact, I could tell you his address. I know him. He's a friend of mine. And he hurt more than one somebody deeply. But I know one of those men he hurt deeply. I don't think he intended to. It's just who he is. One of those men he hurt deeply. It took him years to get to a place of forgiveness. But now once a year, he sends that pastor a note of encouragement. Now, if some pastor has hurt you, you may never get to the point where you send that pastor a note of encouragement. But I promise you, if you give it to God, you can walk away from it. If you really give it to God. But I'll say this and then I'm going to close. When I first got right with God, I smoked a couple of packs of Marlboro's a day. I was cutting down. I had been smoking three or four packs of Marlboro's a day. But I knew, Derek, if I was going to serve God, I didn't need to be smoking. So very often, in those same times when I was saying, Lord, I believe you want me to preach, I was saying, Lord, I'm giving you these Marlboro's. They're yours. Now, I didn't actually bring them up in the church, Hillary. Some people do that. They have them in their pocket. I guess they're not hypocritical, amen. I didn't actually bring mine in the church. They were outside of my truck. But in my mind, I laid them on the altar. And in my mind, I put them back in my pocket when I walked out. Because when I got down the road, I had them over. And some of us do that with anything that we're given to God. Sometimes we do that with bitterness. Lord, I know I'm bitter against this person. Lord, I'm sorry for being bitter against this person. Lord, by your grace, I forgive that person. And then we pick up the hurt when we walk away and carry it with us. And next week, Lord, by your grace, and then we pick up the hurt and we walk it away. And just like there came a time back when I marked us when I didn't pick them up, in my mind, there has to come a time if you've been hurt. And honestly, it is highly unlikely that there is anybody under the sound of my voice that's never been hurt by a family member or a pastor. Or a fellow church member, for that matter. Almost everybody in this room has suffered some hurt at some point at church. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands. But I know from some personal testimony that I've received that there are people under the sound of my voice who've been hurt by people who should not have hurt them. But the only way we can go, the only way we can fruitfully go forward as Christians is to give that to God and say, by His grace, I forgive them. Dear Heavenly Father, I do thank you for all that have gathered here today. I do thank you for the promise of Scripture. That if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness, Lord. I do thank you for the promise of Scripture that we can come boldly before the throne to obtain mercy for which we all need it daily. And to find grace to help in time of need. Lord, only you know if anybody in this room besides me has or is struggling with bitterness towards some per other person. But for your glory and for your honor, I pray that you would help us give it to thee and walk away from it. To obey the scripture, to forgive them as you forgave us. For it's in Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Let's